Today's episode is brought to you by Bit.com. You'll be hearing more about them later on in today's interview, which begins right now. I am joined by the great Harley Bassman, Managing Director at Simplify Investments. Uh, Harley, great to have you here. You are the convexity maven, master in options. You've been in this business a long time. You just wrote a piece about mortgage-backed securities, how you think they're undervalued, and why that make it even more extreme because of the Federal Reserve. You've been really um, hit the nail on the head, not only on inflation, but particularly how that will be very bad for uh, long-duration bonds. And that's probably, Harley, where I want to start. You know, we can put a chart up, which is just the sort of the drawdowns of TLT, the long duration 20 plus year treasury index. And it's 32%, a 32% drawdown from, from the highs. And actually, Harley, I, I think Jim Biango posted a chart that from January 1st to sometime in April, the treasury note index had the worst year from January to April since I think something like 1785. So this has been a historic route in the bond market that even you, a veteran such as yourself, it really stands out. What have you made of this huge sell-off? Why is it significant? And yeah, just tell us tell us what you're thinking about it. Well, thank you. Great to be here. I will say that Kavexi Maven is a self-proclaimed title. It wasn't given by anybody but myself. Um, Let's just hit what, what your, your first comment is a little tricky here, and it's, it's your classic fun with numbers. This is why I advise everyone on the planet, aside from taking a writing class in college, is to take STAT 101 to really understand what's going on under the surface here. Um, you know, very often when you see uh, on the newspapers, if they quote a percent, that usually means they're at least with a very small number. So, you know, if COVID cases go from 1,000 to, 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 to 2,000, there's a 100% increase. But if they went from 100,000 to 105,000, they won't say percent. They then say, went up by 5,000 cases. Uh, in this case here, you're quoting the percent decline of a bond or a bond index as opposed to the, um, uh, the, the yield change. This is a very big deal. What happens is, as rates go up or down, the duration, which means the sensitivity of the bond price to interest rate changes. So when you go back you know, 20, 30 years and bonds were at you know, 8%, a 1% move in rates, so from 8 to 9 or 8 to 7, that might only move a security, a 30 security by 14 or 16 points. When you're up at you know one and a half percent rates, you got 24 year DVO one, and so a one percent move from one to two or whatever it might be will move a bond by 20 odd, 24 odd percent. So you're quoting a percent change here. Most of that is because rates are just so much lower than they ever were before that their sensitivity to interest rates have moved. So, so I can assure you that we've had much bigger yield moves you know, from, from 8 to 11%, or whatever it might be, as opposed to this being from, you know, two and a half, one and a half to two and a half, which is not that much per se in, in rate, but as a price move, it's been gigantic. Um, so that, that must be clear about that. So yes, end of the day, of course, if you have money invested in a bond fund or some interest rate vehicle and rates have done what they do, um, yes, you will lose a third of your money, and that has happened. So um, that, and that, 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 that's a fact. Um, will it continue? I think once again, I'm sure we'll talk about this a little more, is we know, well, people like me know, um, that inflation was going up, has gone up, is going up, will remain high. Is it going to come off eight and go to six? Yeah, sure. But it ain't going to two anytime soon. Um, and we know this um, for various reasons. Uh, OER, uh, Orange Adjusted Rent, um, uh, commodity prices, labor prices, we don't know if rates are going up. And that I'm very, very clear about is that we can all be right on inflation, but the link, seeming link between inflation and interest rates has been broken. Will it return? I don't know. And we can have inflation go up 9%. I can't guarantee you that rates go up for a variety of reasons that we can, we can chat about. And this is very important because it is interest rates that drive the price of bonds. If you have a 30-year bond now yielding 3%, if inflation goes from 6 to 8 that and rates don't move, the bond price doesn't move. Your real return changes, 
but your bond price doesn't move. If you own the FANG stocks that are very rate sensitive, okay, because like we know Amazon will make a trillion dollars in 30 years. The question is, what's that trillion bucks worth today? That's why you have a, a PE to go discount those cash flows back in time to the present day. If inflation goes up and rates don't budge, by the way, Amazon price goes up, not down, because they will make nominal earnings higher by definition as inflation is, but the discounting factor won't have budged. So that's a very interesting concept here. You, you got to be careful when you think about these various things. You have to break apart inflation and interest rates. Harley, you're the uh, creator of the MOVE Index, a, a measure of implied volatility for treasuries. So it's essentially the, the VIX for bonds. That has been yep. going absolutely wild today. I can put up a, a chart of it now. To what do you attribute that? Is that just the Federal Reserve? Uh, is it pricing in, in forward hiking, forward guns, the name of my podcast? Uh, and also, is there also a certain flattening and or steepening of the yield curve that's particularly hard to hedge? I heard you say earlier in another podcast that it's if the, if the yield curve twists, that's almost impossible to hedge. And that's why the, the move index is going crazy. So the move index is the VIX for bonds. It's not quite exactly the same construction. The move is at the money options for 30 days. The VIX is all the options. So the up and down 10%, 20%, 30%, the whole skew of options, um, which is why the VIX trades a little over an at-the-money option. But that's a technicality. For, as far as you're concerned, if you're watching this show, they're the same darn thing. Um, what's going on over here with, with, with the move, and really for every option on a liquid instrument, talking stocks, commodities, FX, bonds, the whole thing, you tend to see one-month options or short-dated options mimic realized volatility. Not always, but in general, on average, you will see implied vol trade 8 to 12% over realized vol. And that's why you have this constant huge selling of one-month options by so many hedge funds or people trying to go and capture um, uh, added value and alpha. Because in theory, if you're selling something, let's say 10% over its you know, realized fair value, and you hedge it every day, that's just straight up insur insurance business. You're selling flood insurance or car insurance, and if you do it often enough and you sell it a little above the actuarial rate, you'll make money. You got, of course, survive the drawdowns, which are bothersome, um, but if you size it properly, you'll make money. The reason why the move exploded so much higher, whereas the VIX did not, right? The VIX went from what, 18 to 28, I mean, really? Um, is that stocks went tick, 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 tick. They slid on down ever so slowly. They really have not realized that high of volatility. It's been a slow, grinding decline. 20% is a huge number, but it was slow. The move, once the Fed kind of um, you know, changed their tune, if you recall, they originally said rates are zero until mid-2023. That was the prediction. Inflation was transitory. We keep rates there. They weren't lying. They were sincere. And as uh, Maynard Keynes said, if the facts change, change my mind, what do, what do you do? Um, the facts changed. It wasn't transitory. Yellen just came out and cried yesterday. I was wrong. By the way, very respectful thing to do. You know, so many politicians refuse to admit they're wrong. No one's always right, you know. I mean, you get in the Hall of Fame if you hit, hit, hit 130 your balls uh, uh, for, 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 uh, for, 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 for a hit. So, I mean, uh, she's, she's fine. Um, You've seen massive, realized rate volatility, especially in the front end, where twos went from 25 cents to almost three. That's a, just a gigantic move, um, especially in percentage terms. Uh, and, and, and so that's why the move's jumped up. And the move is coming down right now because we've seemingly found our level. We've kind of found the, the rate where at least people kind of think, we think we're gonna get to 275 or three, we'll get there. Uh, next June, um, and the curve is flattening, which indicates we kind of think we've found our level. We're going to rotate around two and a half ish, two and three quarters. Um, so that's really moving up, and why, why it's come down. I'm, I'm interested in comparing the, the move to the VIX. I sort of use it as a 
a three-part sandwich. The first layer, what your index captures, implied volatility on treasuries, risk-free securities, intre- uh, uh, credit risk-free, not interest rate risk-free. And then at the top of the layer, layer is equities, which is sort of the sexy stuff that gets all the attention. Huge drawdowns in individual names, Roku, Carvana, whatever. But as you say correctly, in the index itself, the way it's constructed, we, you know, we haven't had a lot of 4% down days. And as such, the VIX, you know, it hasn't gone much higher than, than 35. I want to know, what do you think about the thing in between, which is credit vol? So it's a move, when you say it's the uh, VIX for bonds, VIX for risk-free bonds, treasuries. It's not for credit, not for liquid, uh, LQD, HYG, or let alone mortgage-backed securities. So what do you think about that stuff in the, the uh, stuff in the middle between equities and, and treasuries? Okay, when you look at, um, call it bond risk, okay, interest rate risk. Um, um, what you see is, and if, let me make it a little wider, all, all, all risk for financial assets. There's three components. There's three possible risks. One is duration risk. That's measured by the yield curve. And that's when will I get my money back? They usually have a steep curve because you know what's happening in two years you don't know in 30 years. So usually you demand a higher premium for that, and that's duration risk. And the steeper the curve, that means the more concerned we are about risk in the future, and we demand a higher premium. Now, the reason why the curve's flattening here is the market seems to think, I'll use what seems, that we're going into a recession next year, and thus the risk of higher rates is greatly diminished because recessions tend to bring slower economy, less demand for money, lower inflation, blah, 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 blah. Second risk is credit. Credit is will I get my money back, right? Will I get it back? Will the company pay me or will it default? The third risk is how I get it back. That's convexity. So if you buy a 10-year treasury and you buy it at 100 and that bond goes to 110 and then 95 and then 105, a year from now, well, at the end of the year, you've made five points. And that was it. Didn't matter how it got there. You buy, you know, IBM, 100 over the curve. And it widens to 110 and comes to 90 and then goes to 105. You've made five basis points of spread tightening. Didn't matter how it got there. An option, a convex instrument, it depends how you get there. It is called path-dependent risk. This is a whole different animal this is why, in general, people are really not very good at managing convexity or options because the human mind is just not great at processing a path-dependent activity of how you get there that matters, as opposed to destination. We're very good at saying, here I am, I know where I'll be tomorrow. Okay, We're not good at, at how we get there. And, that, and, and that's the third risk. And if you and implied volatility kind of is the price of that. If you had some super algorithm, which lots of hedge funds do, they'd look at all three risks and say, which one has the highest expected possible return? Okay? Um, And it'll then move money amongst those three different risks as appropriate, as they feel they should. So if one of the risks goes from giving you 10 bucks to giving you five bucks, I'm making up numbers here, the other two are still giving you 10 bucks of profit, you're going to sell the $5 profit instrument and move your money to the two and drive them down to $5 of profit. And that's what you see happen. So if you were to go and graph the VIX, the move, uh, high yield bond spreads, the yield curve, all of those, they go like this over time. Can you trade one versus the other? Please don't. You will lose. You will go bankrupt. They don't do that. You, you, you got to, this is a 30,000 foot idea and the lag time could be months before they catch up and the beta could be small or large. But if you go map all the yield curve versus, versus, versus vol, it's a relative type correlation. Um, same thing with credit. And so you've seen the move go up, but you haven't seen the VIX go up. And that's why credit has not really gone up as much as one might expect so if you put a chart of the move versus credit, it looks like the move's leading and, and credit's lagging, but the VIX is lagging even more on a relative basis. 
So that's what's going on over there with those three things. Now, can you actually really map all three of those vectors? <sighs> Kinda, but they mix with each other. Um, so, so it's tough, but, but, but that's, the, that, that's kind of the, the 30,000 foot answer you're looking for as they're all correlated. And yes, indeed it is kind of surprising. We have not seen credit widened by more, especially high yield credit. And um, uh, my, my, once again, my partner, Michael Green, ha has a detailed this whole concept of if we do get higher rates um, and you see high yield debt, which is an average maturity of five years, um, if we stay in a situation where it's difficult to roll over that debt a year or two from now because rates are higher or we're in a recession so banks don't want to lend, um, you could see a lot of companies um, go bankrupt. Uh, and, and so high yield is certainly at great risk right now, uh, especially if rates go higher, which is why the Fed's probably worried about how far they're going to take rates. Right. And some companies, not only do they owe high yield bonds, which mature in two, three, four years, they specifically owe loans, bank loans that are t so far plus 2%. So it's, it's baked into the cake. They're, they're just going to have to pay more money. Harley, when you said if rates rise, I, I think you're talking about if the risk-free rates, the treasury rates yes. rise. Yeah. But yeah. that is, so if, if people, you know, if someone were to look at HYG uh, year to date, it, it does have a drawdown. Uh, that is, you know, historically, I think, pretty substantial. But a great amount of that drawdown is in the risk-free component, not the actual uh, widening of, of credit spreads themselves. Harley, I want to ask, if we have that capital stack, uh, move, VIX, and credit is in the middle, so uh, treasuries, equities, and then credit in the middle. Which does the Federal Reserve care about? Okay, Harley, you and I know that Carvana down 90%. The Federal Reserve is not going to bail out Carvana. Okay, we, we know that. Uh, but are the, and if it, the s and is down 13%, 14%, we're, you know, that's, the Federal Reserve is not pivoting now. Now maybe a 35%, who knows? I want to get your, your take on that as well. But what about credit? You know, I think it was really the freezing of the credit markets in 2008 that that forced the Fed to, to act, and likewise in March 2020, when the Fed did an unprecedented monetary stimulus. So do you think if high yield spreads widen you know, substantially, would that uh, create like a Powell pivot? Would that, would that become more, more possible or, or no? Unclear. It's path dependent. If, if stocks down 40 percent and it happens, you know, half a percent every week, you know, for a year, they're not going to care. That, truth be told, they'll be probably be happy about that. They'll deflate this bubble without causing a, a systemic problem. It is systemic risk, the pipes of the financial system clogging up, that they're concerned about. Um, so rates going higher and companies going bankrupt slowly, um, that's okay. Uh, once again, they probably would like that. It would, it would take the edge off inflation. If you've got a massive drop where the, the system got clogged up uh, and companies were firing in mass, so inflation, uh, we had unemployment go from, you know, three and a half to, to six, you know, in a month. Then they're going to step on in. So it's really, once again, a path dependent. The Fed wants to go deflate the bubble, reduce the balance sheet. They want to uh, kill demand. They need to kill demand. I use the word need uh, because killing demand means recession, okay, which is not good. Uh, some of those in their job is, is just not a happy situation. Um but the only way to go stop inflation is to reduce demand or increase supply. The Fed can't increase supply, um, so therefore they've got to go reduce demand, and they do that by raising prices. Um, and, and so once again, if they can do it slowly, that's called your soft landing. And I will say this, once again, to those naysayers out there, the Fed can create inflation easy. You just don't want to create it too quickly. And that's what they've been trying to do. They've now done this, but it's gotten away from them. They want to bring it back. Once again, they can go and get rid of inflation. Paul Volcker did that. Um, but taking rates to 21% probably wipes out. That, that would not be pretty if that happened in today's world for so many reasons. Um, the, the massive leverage we have now versus, you know, 40 years ago, uh, a chief among them. So the Fed's trying to go, you know, land the jumbo jet on the aircraft carrier. It is possible. It's possible. It's not likely, but it's possible, and, and that's what they're trying to go and do. I, I think. I think the the more interesting question here is, what does Powell call the Fed want? 
Uh, I would I would I would dial back to. We read certain things over thousands of years because they're right. We read the Greek tragedies, right? We still read them. We at least well, some high schools do. Um, <laughs> we read Shakespeare. Okay. Why we still read these things? Because they, they focus on the great uh, Achilles heel of humanity, ego, hubris. Hubris is always a destroyer of mankind. So once again, let's go look at, and, and our politicians clearly are overwhelmed with ego now as opposed to doing the right thing. Um, I think that was down the middle, right? Didn't see either side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. on both their houses. Yeah, um, there you go. Because they're both egomaniacs right now. Um does Powell want to be remembered as Arthur Burns or as Paul Volcker? Arthur Burns, as some of you might recall, was the Fed chairman during Nixon. Uh, he wanted to raise rates when he saw the inflation coming. Uh, he wasn't allowed to because Nixon threatened to probably, probably kill his family. Um, and he didn't. And thus inflation got out of control and what we had in the 70s, uh, among other problems with demographics. Um, Volcker came in and said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to fix it. You're not going to like it, but I'm going to fix it. Um, and he was no hero at the time. I can assure you that Reagan was not too happy with, with, with the recessions he was dealing with coming up through with the 82 election. But who do we think of fondly now? Volcker is a folk hero. Arthur Burns is a name down the tank that no one even remembers. What do you think Powell wants to be known as come 10, 15, 20 years from now? I can assure you it ain't Arthur Burns. Now, is really Volcker? Maybe not that either, but if you put a gun to his head, he's going to tell you Volcker. And that's why I think that that we should not think he can't go whole hog on this thing if he has to. He is not going to, going to go down in history. The guy is worth X hundred million dollars, had an incredible career. He is not going to tombstone say he let inflation out of the bottle so we're like Venezuela. That's just not going to happen, man. Harley, you've been outspoken that you view quantitative easing as money printing by itself, full stop. We're recording this Friday, June 3rd. Today would be the third day of quantitative tightening. So if quantitative easing is money printing, is quantitative tightening money destruction? And- Money uh, burning? You're answering that. What, what do you think, what do you say? Money burning. Money burning, yeah. So if so, if QT is money burning, what is the, gonna be the effect of, the, of that on, on asset markets as well as volatility? Well, just to be technical, QT has not started yet. It starts June 15th with the first paydowns, but that's a technicality. You're right. Today's the first day. We're on day three. Um, I, I, we have some charts somewhere, which you'll pull up eventually, uh, which shows basically uh, the four main central banks growing their balance sheets by, I don't know, 10, 20 trillion dollars and the value of the you know, civilized world stock markets and bond markets going up tick for tick. Is it a great correlation? Uh, it's spurious? Uh, no, I guess it could be in theory, but no, it's not. Um, the Fed, going back to 08, 09, 10, the Fed wanted inflation. More importantly, they wanted to go get rid of debt. We had too much debt. The way you get rid of debt away from massive growth, which we're not going to have, is you default or you inflate. And inflation is a slow motion default. So they want inflation to go burn off this debt relative to GDP. You get a 4 or 5% inflation rate, the debt doesn't move. You, you, you borrowed $100, you owe $100, but if GDP goes from 20 to $25 trillion, well, then you know, your debt to GDP ratio goes down by 29%. That's a good deal. Um, they tried to create inflation for wages. That didn't work. That's a different, longer story. But I mean, the money went somewhere. The Fed Central banks created inflation. It just was not in wages, so it wasn't in CPI. For God's sakes, man, look at assets, stocks, bonds, housing, jewels, art, all that stuff. It all went up. Now, I mean, which is, of course, a bad public policy you know, result because the rich get richer. We widen the, 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 the wealth gap, which is a disaster, of course. And so was it intentional? No. They wanted to raise middle class labor wages. That's what they wanted to do. They didn't get it. Um, they got it now because um, fiscal is, is, is stepping in finally. But, I mean, we had inflation. And, and if they really drain reserves, uh, they really drain the balance sheet, I don't, like, I can't predict how, when, or whatever, but you're going to see it happen. You're, I mean, the money's got to go get burned out someplace. 
and um, through the various pipes of, uh, of the economy, uh, you should see asset prices come down. Um, once again, when, how, where, uh, I'm not going to go predict that. Uh, I'll just say at a macro, 30,000 foot level, um, they printed money and now they're burning money. That's it. Today's episode is brought to you by Bit.com, a leading cryptocurrency trading platform. From spot to futures to options trading and more, Bit.com has it all. So whether you're a seasoned investor or you're new to the game, you need to be on Bit.com. Bit.com has launched a zero taker fee option campaign until May 10th. To enroll, email VIP at Bit.com. That's Bit spelled B-I-T. So email VIP at Bit.com and tell them I sent you. And so the assets on the balance sheet are treasuries as well as agency mortgage-backed securities. So they, they will be letting those roll off, not selling, but letting those roll off uh, $95 billion so a month. So far, not selling. So far, not selling. Yes. Yes. Well, we'll get into that on the mortgage-backed securities. But first, Harley, I, I just want to give you credit on the uh, treasury trade. You know, you've structured a certain trade that has, you have know, made it public via Simplify, via one of your ETFs. And... That trade is essentially well. T- t- uh, tell us it is. It's essentially an, an option that's uh, a put option on uh, long duration treasuries, and you know long duration treasuries, as I said, historic routes going back to seventeen uh, hundreds. So yeah, just just tell us a little bit about that trade. Are you surprised how much you've been right? Uh, do you think you part of it was just you got lucky? Um, and then yeah, I mean we we can just put up a chart of of that ETF. It's been pretty pretty good. I will always <laughs> I'll always take. Better lucky than smart. Let's just begin with that. Um, here's what we knew. We knew that rates at, you know, 1%, 0%, negative rates in Europe on, I don't know, $18 trillion. That was the wrong price, man, okay? Let's just let's knock it off. That's the wrong price. I mean, the only reason why you had negative rates in Europe is, one, the ECB put them there, but two is if you're a large pension fund, you can't go and take a billion dollars in cash and put it under your pillow. You got to go put it somewhere for safekeeping. So in essence, negative rates was just, a, was just the cost of of security, someone storing the money somewhere. But that, that, that's of course ridiculous to have negative rates. We knew it was going was going to end. We just didn't know when, and it happened a lot later than we thought. What I did uh, when I joined Simplify is we created the Simplify interest rate hedge. I we can't give a ticker, and it was a it was simply this. Uh, it was a, a half of a treasury, five year treasury. And half the money went to buy, effectively, a seven-year put option in the 30-year treasury. There's nothing else out there that does this, okay? Uh, options on, 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 on TLT or put options on TLT, they go out, what, maybe six months? Um, they're not that liquid. Uh, over here, you can, you know, basically buy options on millions of dollars. And that's because we source this option from the over-the-counter uh, 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 bank market, so uh, OTC market. So, so we basically face directly with Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, and Barclays. Uh, we'll soon be adding a few more. And a gentleman's trade there is a hundred million dollars. I mean, the bond. Let's remember, the bond market is much bigger than the stock market. Stocks go the airplay. Jim Cramer talks about stocks. He talks about bonds, but we are much bigger than the stock market. And and uh, the size of money that flows through there is humongous versus stocks. Um, you try buying $100 million of, of, of some equity, you know, it's, 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 it's going. Uh, $100 million of, of bonds doesn't budge. Um, and that's what we did. And by making a seven-year option, you had time, years, to be wrong. Um, it just so happened that we brought the product a year ago, May, and, you know, the market finally moved. Um, and and uh, uh, the product closed the year at 38 it got as high as 64. I think it's trading 54, 55 right now. Um, it is a direct drive exposure to interest rates. If rates go back down again, this will go down, period. If rates go up, this will go up, period. Uh, it's direct drive exposure uh, in a convex way because it's an option. It can go up by a lot, only down by a little or by less. Um, and that's it. Um, it's, a, it's a clever idea. It's working well. Um, and if you're curious, uh, my, adver- my, my, my advice is for every million dollars of interest rate risk, which can include owning bonds or bond fund, uh, stocks that have long uh, durations to them, uh, 
if you um, are building a, a multifamily home and you and you and put in financing is a couple of years away, um, you buy five percent of this product, this hedge for this. So if you have a million dollars of risk, you buy fifty thousand dollars of the hedge, and and that's how we size it. Um, if you want to speculate, be my guest. But truth be told, this is a hedge product because uh, it will be volatile. It has a lot of moving parts inside of it. It only has two, two trades, a treasury and an option. But that option is impacted by volatility, by the yield curve, by skews, by lots of different things. So it, it, it wiggles a bit. Right. And it's a it's a very complex product. So it's not like it you know trades every, every second. I, yeah. Also, just say that if you own a seven-month put option on TLT, you constantly would have to roll that, whereas this is a seven-year option. I want to ask you, Harley, when I first heard you talking about this trade, I think the reason you were so attracted to it was that the, not just that you thought the yields were going to go up, bond prices would go down, the delta, but you thought that the implied volatility was much too cheap. How much of the profit of this trade has been just rates have gone up and it's a you know, delta has been in your favor? Um, and, and to what degree have you actually had a sort of vega move in your favor where p- the, the market has uh, implied volatility has spiked as people are saying, hey, Rates are moving higher. Maybe we should price this option a little bit higher in terms of vol. Um, vols have, have, have been volatile. Um, when this trade came out, I, I think you're going to show a chart. That chart is the at the money option. That's really the only access you have to this thing is to, is to chart that number. Um, this option um, was initially 200 basis points out of the money. And it is since, you know, as rates have gone up, um, it's come closer, so the skew rolls on down. Um, when we brought this thing, uh, the vol you paid for the option was about seventy four seventy five, um, with the at the money being like sixty four sixty five, so about ten point spread there. Um, this the the vol got as high as eighty six on this option. It's now backed off to about seventy seven seventy eight. So and that's probably worth about five points. So this thing probably went. Five points too high, but it's since come back to the level where it was. So it's a much better trade now. The offset to this was the yield curve inversion. And I wrote about this uh, on my commentary uh, a few months ago. If you go to convexitymaven.com, I have all my stuff there. If you want to join my, I, I publish every four to six weeks. Just send me an email. I'll add you to my list. So the one called Fire Insurance Revisited. I go in detail through each separate component of the funding cost, uh, the yield curve, uh, volatility, rate level, the whole thing, and I deconstruct the whole trade. Um, but this ticket, I, I, I push that and call it complicated. You could model this on Bloomberg or on Excel spreadsheet. I mean, all you need is, 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 is two interest rates and, and a volatility, and that's it. Um, and the modeling I do in my various commentaries is I just fix vol at a number, whatever it is at the time, and move the curve in parallel. Is that fair? No, not at all. Uh, the curve will not be moving parallel. Um, but I got no plan B. I mean, I got to assume something, and I think moving it in parallel is as fair as you can get. To start to imply curve movement is really speculative. I can assure you that versus a year ago and now, nobody thought the curve was going to flatten and invert. Uh, at at, at two, 275. Like, I mean, maybe Rosie and Lacey did, but no one else on the planet did. So um, I, 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 to go and start uh, projecting yield curve movements is, is a step too far even for me. Yeah, let's actually show a chart of the yield curve inversion. This is a, a 10-year treasury minus a two-year treasury. It inverted very briefly a few months ago. Since then, it is exited inversion Harley, how much of a harbinger for a recession do you think this is? Okay, so I publish every four to six weeks because I only publish by something to say that I think is interesting and meaningful. Um, people who are paid to publish once a week or even once a day, which I find utterly insane. Nothing happens every day that's newsworthy. I can assure you of that. But that's your job, man. You got to go put something out. This is the kind of chart that people put out who have to publish something once a day. This is not the right chart. The actual rule is the three-month treasury versus the 10-year treasury. Now, people like me will go and put up charts 
like um, twos, tens, or maybe swap rates, or maybe forward rates, um, which are which are interesting and, and, and by themselves. But we actually have not inverted to the real rule, which is a three month treasury versus the ten year treasury. As a matter of fact, that um, spread has actually widened, gotten bigger. In forward space, we've inverted. We've crazy inverted. Um, so this is a little tricky here. Um, and, and so we got to wait and see how far the Fed actually goes in and pushes things or how far the back end comes down. I recall now your, your question from before, which is about the volatility of the yield curve and why it went so crazy a couple of months ago. We had twos exploding higher in rate, lower in price, whereas bonds were actually rallying. Um, so you'd see, usually what you see is twos up by 10 basis points, bonds up by five. So they both go up, but twos by more, so the curve flattens, or vice versa. Um, what you saw for a month uh, a while ago was twos up by 15 and bonds down by five. This is very, very rare. It's a curve rotation where the actual sign is different. This is... I won't say impossible to hedge, but there's body bags being carried away uh, when this happens. It, it, it's very hard to manage this as a dealer or as anybody for that matter. The reason why this happened, I will propose to you, is that there were, you know, X billion of structured notes issued three, four, five years ago as a way to go and get added yield to retail clients. And I bought these things for my own personal account. I'm not saying anything bad about them. They look like this. You get a 7% yield for a year. After that, you get five times the spread between the two-year and the 30-year. So if two's 30s is at uh, 2%, then you get a 5%, a 10 percent coupon. If they're at 1%, you get a 5% coupon. If they go negative, the dealer will not take the money from your account. They're principal protected, principal guaranteed. You can't take the money back. The dealer, unfortunately, is hedged, and he doesn't have that option, that, 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 that you know, uh, goodie. He's not getting the money back from people. He has to go take off the hedge. He takes it off by selling twos and buying 30s. And so if you go look at the shape of the yield curve in forward space, which is where this, because these guys are hedging up the next five years, when that thing went through zero, all hell broke loose in the market. And that's what really drove this massive power flattening and inversion in forward space is dealers taking off the billions of dollars of hedges they had on because they were short a zero strike option to mom and pop. Once we have gotten through it, and we're now through it in forward space by a lot, um, things will stabilize. That's why you've seen you know, the market, the curve stabilize. If we ever get the curve to start to steepen again and those forward rates start to get near zero, you're going to see a massive power steepening as dealers put the hedge back on again. The curve will get extraordinarily volatile if we ever get that 230s curve back towards zero in forward space. So that was your first question. That's why it happened. Um, uh, will, is, the, is, is the curve predicting a recession? Curve's almost always right. Um, and because the money goes there for various reasons. Um, are we going to get a recession, you know, next year? I, I don't know. I mean, the curve per se, the classic curve of three months versus 10 year is not even close. But, you know, in, you know, three months or six months, we're going to get there. If that's going to take rates up, and three month rate's going to be, you know, buck fifty higher. Well, then it'll be interesting. So uh, we're not there yet. And indeed, the curve inverted in November 18, and I wrote a story back then, a commentary back then, where I said, everything looks great. I have no idea how it's going to happen, but we're going to go to a recession in March, April of 2020, because we had the signal and, you know, you got to stick with the program. It's, it's, it's never different this time. Um, so did I predict COVID? No, but it did happen. Okay. So right now, you're not seeing the same flash of recession, recession sh signal as you were in 2018. No, but I mean, away from that, you can't argue what the curve's doing. I mean, you have fives, tens inverting uh, in treasuries, um, and certainly twos, thirties uh, is, is, you know, pretty close. I mean, I mean, 
the fact that it hasn't actually inverted, forget that. I mean, we have eight inflation print and the back end's, you know, rallying. I mean, you got, to, I mean, the, the market is queuing that if not recession, we're talking massive slowdown in the economy. Okay, I mean, let's not bury the lead here. I mean, the curve is flattened dramatically, um, and and and, and that, that means something. Yes, but again, Harley, you just play devil's advocate. You know, thirty-two percent drawdown on TLT. You know, your product doing very well. Um, wor you know, worst a year, worst uh, start to the year for the ten-year Treasury note index since George Washington. There's been so much, how much more pain can we have in the long end? The fact, it's a relative. So the, the fact of the matter is the short end has gone up so much, if you look at the move index, that because the Federal Reserve was so far behind the curve. So how could it be any other way? You can get a lot more pain, man. I mean, you know, rates at the two handle with inflation at eight, you have a lot more pain, okay? <laughs> it's, I mean, it, it, it's only painful because we started at one and a half percent. That's why, I mean, but by the way, three is still, that's still a crazy low number over the history of time. You know, we, we just, I mean, it's kind of like, you look at spoos right now at like, you know, 410 or 415. Um, that's only down 20% because we were at 4,800. We could argue that 4,800 was the wrong number and now we're closer to the right number. I mean, when you, when you see a change in something, it's unclear which is the wrong number. I mean, Netflix is down 70%. Uh, that's probably because the $700 price was the wrong number, not because today's you know, 190 is the wrong number. Harley, now let's move on to mortgages. Uh, mortgage rates became were so low for, for so long over the, over the past two years. To what degree was that because of quantitative easing? And they've had a historic spike over the past six months. To what do you attribute that? And then we'll explain why you're, you're starting to get sort of, I guess, cautiously bullish on, on mortgage-backed securities. Okay, so what, more than, I'm not cautiously bullish, I'm very bullish on mortgage-backed securities. All right, um, all right. So uh, uh, the low mortgage rates uh, was, a, was a feature, not a bug. Uh, the Fed's um, driving of that uh, was a 105% you know, correlation to them. Okay, let's not fool around, man. That's not that chart, that one. I mean, the Fed drove mortgage rates down. They drove mortgage-backed securities to as low as, you know, 20 basis points over treasuries. This is insanity. The forever average is 75. This is just nuts. Um, and, and they did that. And they did that because they wanted to go and help people buy housing. That's a public policy good. It's well known that, 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 that home ownership is well correlated with, with economic and social success. Um, I won't also not go into why that is, but it's just a well-known fact. Um, and so they did a good deed. They also drove the market to the wrong price. Um, you can see where they announced they were going to stop buying, and kaboom, off we went. Um, we're now, we got as high as like 115. It's now like 105 as a spread. Once again, that's the wrong number, okay? I mean, it's the wrong number. Uh, and now it could be the wrong number for a while, but that's the wrong number. And it's, it's going to tighten back in again because... If you can go, if you're a pension fund or an insurance company and you can buy a effectively government bond at 100 over treasuries, what's over treasuries? Like, ding dong, wrong price, right? Yes, you have convexity risk. And I detail that in my latest commentary. But I mean, really? Like, why are you going to buy a bond that might default when you can buy something that won't default no matter what? Yeah, Harley, I just want to make that clear clear that you know some people they might have seen the big short the uh, somewhat familiar with the 2008 financial crisis and they think of that when they hear mortgage backed securities but the mortgage backed securities that melted down uh, were there was credit risk there were private mortgage backed securities that were packaged into extremely toxic and uh, uh, labyrinthine structures this is just pretty vanilla mortgages that are guaranteed they have no credit risk they're guaranteed by Fannie Mae right so your risk here is interest rate risk not credit risk do i have that right Exactly. Yes. Fannie, Fannie Mae, your risk of mortgages is convexity risk. Um, okay. Fannie, if, if, it, if, if, it, if it says Fannie, Freddie, or Ginny, it will not default. Period. It won't default. Now, uh, and you will get your principal and interest on a timely basis. The servicer, people behind Fannie and Freddie, they got to go deal with the nonsense of, of, of foreclosures and everything else. But you will get your money every 30 days on time 
rain or shine, no matter what. Now, you might get all your money back in three months. You might get it back in 30 years. Um, that you don't know. That's the convexity issue. But you're getting your money back, man. Don't worry about that. If you're afraid to fall, like, you better own guns and cans of tuna uh, because it's, 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 it's the end of the world. Explain why I might expect to get my money in three years, but I actually get it back in 30 years. What would have to happen for, for that to happen, and why is that a risk? This is why we hired, you know, a football stadium of physics PhDs, you know, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, to go and figure out what would make a mortgage prepay. Let's go look at a single person. He takes out one loan, takes it out at 4%. He has the right to prepay that loan whenever he wants, no penalty. Now, most other countries, except for Denmark, don't have fixed rate loans for 30 years that you can prepay. Um, if you were uh, give you a multifamily loan or commercial loan, there's a prepay penalty for those. In home mortgages, there are not, because the U.S. government did not want people to go and have to pay a penalty to refinance. You have a 4% loan. Rates go to three, and, and that loan flows on through to a buyer and buys the 4% loan. We ignore all the, 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 the costs in between. So homeowner takes out a 4% loan, and you know uh, IBM Pension buys the 4% loan. Um, rates go to three. The homeowner ref calls up the broker, refinances, pays off his 4%, and takes out a 3% loan to lower his mortgage costs. IBM has that loan called from them. They get their money back all early, and now they got cash. So what are they going to do? Well, they got to now buy 3% bonds, right? They're not going to sit in cash. And so they basically thought they had money locked up for, for a decade at 4%. Turns out they only had it for a year. Now they got nine years at 3%. They're sad. But they got an extra yield for that, taking that risk. If rates go to 5%, whoever says, I got a 4% loan. I can't believe I did this. He's, he's, not, he's not prepaying that loan. As a matter of fact, if rates went to like 8%, he might not be able to move ever because he's locked in that 4% loan. And if he moved to a new house, he has to pay 8% to go and do it. So he's, he's kind of stuck there. Now, Ginny Mays are, 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 are assumable, but ignore that small detail. Um, that loan's staying on the books for a long time. Now, IBM, when they bought the 4% bond, they did their bond math and said, you know what? I think this bond's going to pay off almost all of its money over seven years. Okay, I'll line everything up and I'll get that and I'll reinvest the money you know, in seven years. Well, now it's like a 20-year security and they're getting a 4% yield at, at, at for 20 years and they could have invested the money at 8% if they got the money back earlier. So they lose both ways, okay? Homeowner wins both ways. Uh, the question is, what is that option to prepay worth? So what will, the, what will IBM demand in extra yield over treasuries to take that uncertainty, that path dependency risk. Now, there's more than just rates. If the economy is doing great, employment's down at 2.5% unemployment, and people are getting calls for jobs everywhere, and I'm sitting in California, and I got a call for guessing, I will double your salary to move to Austin to go and code for me. Okay, house sold. Moving to Austin, man. When do you sell the house, what happens? Loan gets paid off. Grandma's in the house. Granny dies. Okay, house gets paid off. Husband and wife are in the house. They get divorced. House gets sold to go pay the divorce settlement. That gets paid off. Guy loses his job. Gets foreclosed upon. House foreclosed. Loan's paid off. All these things drive it. The yield, yield curve gets very steep. People will go from a fixed rate to an arm to go finance to pay off the front end. All these things drive and, and and they intermingle with each other okay so um and that's that's what these geeks do they sit in the back room they try and figure out how all these things will fit together and then you know we then say okay what is the value of the option and we look at at, at a mortgage security and say how much over treasuries am i getting it's worth let's say 50 cents 50 basis points and i'm getting 75 oh Pretty good deal. It's worth 50 of getting 25. I don't want those things anymore. That's kind of how the game is played over here and where the quants fit in. And then OAS, option adjusted spread, is where we go and take the theoretical model, pull that out of the mortgage security and see what's left. If I'm getting a lot more, that's a positive OAS. I'm getting a spread over the option value. If it's under negative OAS, I'm getting paid less. 
And the charts I've been showing you here basically are mapping out these various numbers and try to say, here's the, the average we have over time. If it's way above or way below, I'm going to buy or sell right now uh, with the, with the uh, mortgage um, spread at 100, 510 over. That's, a, that's a two standard deviations. And if you look at that chart again, we only got there twice before, man. Once in 08, 09, and once in, in, during COVID. I mean, we're not going to stay here. So the mortgage is going to tighten back on in. So there's prepayment risk where you get the people get the call to go to Austin, they can't cancel the mortgage, they pay it back, or mortgage rates decline and they can refinance, they also pay it back. There's also extension risk, which is mortgage rates go increase a ton as they have over the past six months, and therefore no one refinances. So the uh, refinance uh, that was priced in is actually wrong. So therefore mortgages the mortgage-backed security you thought was three years is actually 10 years. Which is a greater risk? Which, which I mean, I guess it's different for different parties, but uh, what are investors more worried about, extension risk or prepayment risk? Um, investors, in general, prepayment risk um, because they thought they had a 4 or 5% security and now they got to reinvest the money at a low rate. And now they reinvest the money at 3 then rates go back up again. Well, now it's like, holy cow, man, I had 4. I sold it. I didn't want to, but I got prepaid. I invested at three, and now rates are at five, and my bond's trading at, 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 you know, is down 15%. Um, that, 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 that is a bigger problem. Extension risk, we don't like it, but when we bought the bond at four, we were happy at four. We liked it four. If it's 15 years versus seven years, I'm not brokenhearted, but I, kind of, I knew what I was getting into when I bought the bond, okay? I mean, a mortgage security is not a one-year or two-year treasury. Okay, so you kind of knew you're getting into a, an intermediate term duration security. Uh, so prepay risk is, from the investor standpoint, is the best and bigger problem. So investors in private investors aren't too worried about extension risk. What about the Federal Reserve? Oh, well, I mean, they don't care. I mean, they just print the money, man. They're, they're, I mean, they're, they're taking a loss to who? So, so, the, so the, 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 the price of the bond goes from, a, from 105 to, to 90, and they have, a, 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 in theory, a loss. Who cares? I mean, the loss to who? They'll print the money. I mean, it doesn't make a difference. They'll carry their balance sheet. And they've already, and they've already said that if we have a loss, we have a special account to put it into to go and, you know, book it. But I mean, it doesn't matter. Right. I, I don't think they're worried about the loss. But what about the fact that they've assured the market uh, or they said that they at this time are currently not entertaining? Uh, you know, it doesn't look like we're going to have to sell mortgage-backed securities. We're going to let them roll off. And they want to do 35 at the. They want to reach a level of rolling off 35 billion dollars of mortgage-backed securities a month. But what if the maturity of those MBSs extend and they they won't be allowed to roll, and not as much as rolling off, and they will be forced to either not get to their 35 billion dollar goal, or they will have to sell MBS into the market, which, based on from what I've heard from people in the market, would be a disturbance because you're sort of flooding the market with. Uh, new issue with issues that the market thought it didn't have to worry about. Is this something that pe people should be worried about or now? I don't think so. I mean, I, I got to go talk to, to Ira at Bloomberg. Uh, he's their, their bond uh, guy there. Um, he's terrific. Um, I think the actual wording is a maximum of 35, not a target of 35. Um, and so if it got to 40, they would then buy some back to make it 35. I don't think their target is 35. I think that's their maximum limit. So if it comes at 20, I'm not sure they hit the bid for 15. I could have read this thing wrong, but I think that's actually the actual wording was a, was a maximum of 35, not a target of 35. Same thing for Treasury. You're right. It's, 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 it's called a cap. You're, you're, you're definitely right about that. Yeah. I don't think they, I don't think they hit the bid. They, they might. If, if, if inflation keeps running really hot at, 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 at 8 They'll, 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 they'll go tap the bid. But the problem is, if they go call up, you know, Goldman or Morgan or Merrill and say, you know, you know, bid, you know, uh, you know, five billion Fanny Fours. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that will be that'll be a problem, man. Um, I don't think they I don't think they sell mortgages. I, I, I think they're likely to go and, and sell treasuries first. I mean, they, they, they prefer to be out of the mortgage business. They, they do want to do that. But um, it would be it would be challenging because. You know, you have a much, well, the mortgage market's huge. It's a smaller base of people. You're not going to have, you know, China and Japan and, and the other world centric banks buying mortgage bonds as much as they'll buy treasuries for their, for their reserves. 
You know, I mean, I can assure you that the that the foreign central banks do own Ginnies, you know, and mm-hmm. some Fannies. Guarantee mm-hmm. you that. But I, I think they're going to, they, I mean, I prefer they go and tap the back end, truth be told, uh, in, the, in these whole 30-year treasuries. Steep in the yield like curve. sell a ton of 30-year treasuries. Well, I, that, my preference is they steepen the yield curve. I, I, I think mm-hmm. it's a public policy good to steepen the yield curve for a lot of reasons I've written about in the past. Um, uh, pr- pr- primarily, it strengthens the financial system by, I hate saying it, giving money to, to banks. Um, I mean, we are a financial economy. We're massively levered. Debt to GDP is a gigantic number. We need the plumbing to work in the system. Should bad guys have gone to jail 10 years ago? Yes. Was it a public policy mess that they didn't? Yes. Clearly, we had the ability to do it. In 89, we sent lots of guys to prison in the SNL crisis. So we could have gotten Stan O'Neill and his, you know, other bad guys if we wanted to. Um, but um, we need a strong banking system just to keep the, keep the, keep the money flowing. You you're definitely have been in the inflation camp, which has obviously been right. What if owner equivalent rent is in the double digits and there is an even greater pressure from society, uh, from the, the government on the Federal Reserve to tighten monetary policy as fast as possible? And the Federal Reserve, they need to get to $35 billion uh, to, 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 to slow down the housing market. Possible, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm not gonna say no. I, I think I mean, I, I think I know. I, I know what I think they should do. Um, that doesn't mean they're gonna do it, and it doesn't mean I'm right either. Um, I, like I said, I think I think they should they should they should sell long dated uh, treasuries to go steep in the curve, and have the mortgage market hold uh, hold spread at you know hundred 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 over. Um, mm-hmm. But um, but also if rates go, you're gonna see a massive supply uh, collapse in the mortgage market. The refi index is already down by a gazillion. I mean, housing market is gonna is gonna stop dead in its tracks real fast. If you look at, if you consider that the average civilian, okay, not Wall Street gazillionaire, does not buy a house. They sign up for a 30-year stream of payments. Let's just say the payments are two thousand a month. That's what he can afford. He's not getting a big bonus, okay? His his income ain't moving by more than four or five percent. He can afford two thousand a month, and that's it. You go work backwards into the calculation. I wrote about this also um, a while ago. Called, it's called House of Cards. It's in my uh, uh, archives. Um, you know, rates down two three years ago basically covers about eighty five percent of why housing jumped by like twenty two percent because rates went from five and a half to three and a half you know, lower the payment. So if you up the payment back to your 2000, you could borrow 20% more money. Well, we're now doing the reverse. And so in theory, with rates at five and a quarter as opposed to three and a quarter, uh, to keep a constant payment, houses got to be down by 15 odd percent to go and do that. Um, will that happen? I don't know. But if, but if it doesn't happen, then houses is going gonna, is gonna to stop. People, there's only so much money you have. Okay, you, 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 there's no free lunch out there. Well, the MMT crowd thinks there is, but away from that, there's no free lunch. So housing, housing part of the economy is going to hit a brick wall real fast. What does real fast mean? Because I've got an extremely unscientific and un, you know, non-quantitative uh, uh, observation, which is just that the case Schiller does not typically have a blow off top like a like a speculative tech stock. You know, it. It, it, if, it, if it's shooting up, exploding higher as it is now, first it has to roll over, increase slowly, then flatline, then decline slowly, and then it will finally uh, uh, plummet. But that whole process takes you know eighteen months or two years. So when you say really quickly, how much? How what are we talking here? Um, well, there's housing prices, and you are correct. The ho- the housing market is like Wiley e. Coyote. Okay, the problem hits. And it keeps running. It takes like a year. If you you looked at the 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 eighty nine downturn, the 08 downturn, both times you saw housing keep on going even after you'd already blown up the bridge. Um, so yes, it'll take a year before prices turn down. But as far as the economy goes, so people the, the people building the houses and the, the guys selling the lumber and the copper for the pipes and this and that that's the whole economy, the, the jobs related to the housing market that will slow down because demand. Will slow down at least demand for 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 um for used houses, new houses. I mean, the demographic is still plowing ahead, 
Um, so it's going to be interesting how this all plays out. But, I mean, clearly, I mean, you've taken rates up by two points, man. I mean, the numbers are the numbers. I mean, unless people have borrowed money from mom and dad, which might happen. I mean, there is a massive amount of money with the, with the, uh, the boomers who will give to the millennials. And maybe that ha that's what happens. Um, but the, the, the money is, is gone. Now you got to go and plug the hole somehow. And you plug the hole by, you know, not buying a house, taking money from mom and dad, or lowering the house price. Pick your poison. Uh, well, Harley, as we, as we approach a close, what would your highest conviction view be at this point? Would it be your, your thesis that's bullish on mortgage-backed securities, or would it be some other area in macro, in bonds, credit, stocks, or volatility? I think that mortgages relative to safe assets um, will do better. That, that I feel most confident in saying that. Now, by the way, if treasuries go up by 1% in rate, mortgage bonds will also go down, but they'll go down, I think, by, by their rate will rise by, by 50 basis points or 40 basis or 60 basis points. They'll, they'll move by less. So if you have a portfolio and in that portfolio you have an amount dedicated to interest rate called bonds, but rate stuff, um, and that in that basket is treasury funds or investment grade credit funds or high yield funds, I would sell those, not with the tax impact, and move into mortgage funds. That's my, that would be my, my most confident prediction. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm very comfortable that inflation stays high. I'm not comfortable in saying what bonds will do. We could have a negative real rate for quite a while because truth be told, the Fed likes that. Fed likes a negative real rate. They may not say it, but they like it. The high nominal inflation reduces the amount of debt, reduces the value of the debt, reduces debt to GDP, yet the negative rate encourages the economy because people will borrow money at a negative rate to start a business. So you get both. You get the economy does well because of negative real, but debt, nominal debt to GDP collapses because of inflation. So a negative real rate is their, their dream scenario. So... You're confident inflation will remain high and that it won't crash down to 2% or even lower anytime soon, but you don't know what, what bonds are going to do. If they bonds can just continue to rise, uh, the, the product that you structured probably will continue to do well. Uh, if if, it, if they stay low, which you, you say is definitely very possible as well, uh, that will be sort of, I think you use the phrase nirvana for risk assets because the E for earnings at Amazon is increasing, but the P in terms of uh, the price is, is not the, is the price isn't going down because the discount rate is, is staying level or, or it's going down as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then can you explain your, you said that, you know, obviously nothing you say is investment advice, but you, you said that maybe getting out of investment grade and high yield bonds into mortgage backed securities. Can you explain what the sort of the risk swapping you're doing? Like, uh, why do you want to go move away from credit risk and into convexity risk? What risks are you avoiding by, by making that switch? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm getting rid of default risk, um, which, is, which is nice. If we've got a recession, then you're going to have defaults and, and, and credit spreads widening. But also, it's just, it's just the relative level. I mean, when you buy a mortgage security, it's, it's just a buy right. You're buying a bond and selling a call on the bond. You're doing a buy right. I mean, vols are very, very high right now. So buying a bond and selling the call on it, just a good idea. You're selling the call at a very inflated price. So that's why I like it. It's, it's just simple, you know, relative value RV, um, one versus the other. So I kind of like that. The other thing I like also, they've tightened back in a bit, muni bonds. Double A or better muni bonds. I mean, in Calif you could buy, I, mean, I bought California muni bonds last month at a 4.1% yield. But a 4% coupon, price of 99. And in my tax bracket, which is not everyone's, but in California, you're 50% pretty quick. So that's an 8% pre-tax yield. 8% yield is getting close to equity returns over, 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 over time. So, and then if you buy that um, kind of thing, you then buy my, my hedge product with it to go in and, and soften up the, uh, the convexity of it. And the mortgage bonds also. Mortgage bond is selling a rate option. My hedge product is buying a rate option. Um, and there are different parts of the term surface. So you're actually kind of, I won't say locking in a profit, but the option you're buying in my hedge product 
is probably 30% cheaper than the option you're selling in a mortgage security. Hmm. Interesting. My, my final question for you, Harley, concerns a convexity position that I think you've been uh, very favorably inclined towards for a long time, and that is buying uh, longer duration call options on equity indices, the S&P 500, as well as uh, European equities. Um, and I, I just think, you know, historically, that's just done, done very well because we've been in a bull market and I think uh, call options have kind of been underpriced. Uh, setting that aside, what do you what are your views on those two trades now, given that we're in, you know, a, a pretty severe equity uh, route uh, in both Europe and and S&P 500? Oh, this is a very complicated question. Um, one of the key value adds in the long dated call option and Europe is going on five years in the U.S., two years, was the borrowing rate, the interest rate where you borrow money. Because when you buy, let's say you, you, you buy a call option on a million dollars of stock, you're basically borrowing that million dollars from the option seller, like Citadel. They have to go then fund the borrowing of that stock um, to go and put their hedge on. Um, and they can do it pretty easily. When rates were at a quarter percent out for two years, then when you bought the call option on the U.S. index, you're borrowing money. You're locking in via the option a borrow for two years at a quarter percent. Well, now rates are like two and a half, two and three quarters on two-year rates. This trade is not nearly as attractive uh. when you are borrowing at two and three quarters than borrowing at 25 cents. In Europe, you're borrowing at negative 0.5. Now rates are positive buck and a half. And when you take you know 200 basis points, to the, to the fifth power, I mean, it's a, that's a huge difference in, uh, in, in in the value add. And also, vols are a lot higher. I mean, right. buying long-dated calls is, is still not a bad ticket, um, but uh, it's not nearly as good as it was because vols are higher and front-end rates are higher also. So you've really lost a lot of the, of the value for that. Okay. Uh, well, Harley, thank you so much for joining us. People can, uh, f- can find your work um, uh, on Twitter, at Convexity Maven. Uh, your blog, Convexity Maven, people should definitely check that uh, as well, as, w- as well as the work you've been doing with uh, Simplify. Thanks so much, Harley. Thank you so much. Have a good day. 